Well, good evening and welcome to the Elgin County Museum. My name is Mike Baker. I'm the curator and also president of the Elgin County Historical Society. Uh, it's nice to see so many people here. And we won't mention to Mr. Crocker how many are actually up here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome members of the ACO, St. Thomas Elgin as well, and thank Lawrence very much for putting out a notice for this talk, because otherwise it wouldn't have gotten out. Plus, I noticed you got the headline the last two days in the Times Journal for what's on, so you can keep putting our notices out if you like. <laughs> well done. Um, at the conclusion of Paul's remarks, um, both Lawrence and I are going to announce some uh, programs for upcoming meetings, so we'll do that after, uh, after uh, Paul's talk, though. Uh, Paul Baldwin will be familiar to most of you, if not as your history teacher for one of 33 years when Paul was working for the Elgin County Board of Ed, all over Elgin County. He may have been your mayor in Elmer or your warden in Elgin County, which he was in 2006. Paul's been a student of the architects of Elgin County and St. Thomas for many years. I know I've learned a great deal from several of his writings, including a, a large a series called Our Legacy, which appeared in the old uh, Our Community Press for many years. You remember what those used to look like? He had a, a fairly <coughs> regular column. There he is. Your hair was, hair. Sl hair was slightly <laughs> different color, but <laughs> it is him. So I've been enjoying those uh, uh, very much, uh, the, um, the few issues that we have, thanks to uh, Mr. Verrill for bringing them in one day. Um, later this week, uh, our show on John Finley will be joined by a show on uh, the surviving one-room schoolhouses in Elgin County. That'll be in that big empty spot where there isn't anything right now. And those are shot by Jan Rowe, who also did a fair number of the uh, photographs in the Finley exhibition. So. Thank you, Jan, for putting in, as usual, more hours than uh, you probably wanted to, but I know you love it, so uh, we're the beneficiary of it, though. Uh, we are very pleased to have been able to provide a home for the two decades of ruminating and thinking and collecting uh, that Paul's done on, on uh, Mr. Finley, and uh, I think we've created a, a celebration of one of our county's best architects. So, Paul. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening and I'm very pleased to note that the Elgin County Historical Society and the Architectural Conservancy of, of uh, Ontario and uh, St. Thomas Elgin Branch are having a joint meeting and uh, I'm glad to see friends here and I thank you very much for coming. Uh, before I speak to you for, about John Finley, uh, let me offer uh, some introductions and some thank yous. Uh, first of all, I introduce uh, uh, members of John Finley's family. Um, John and Ann Finley, and his son Donald, and uh, Donald Mary uh, Eileen Barton. And we have uh, with us tonight from Peterborough, Eileen Barton, uh, who's sitting in the front row, and uh, her daughter Terry, and her son John. And uh, Don, uh, John, they just had one son, and that was uh, Donald, passed away. Uh, but they've been immensely helpful to me in learning about John, uh, not only through some pictures that they had, but through some personal things that I didn't realize when I first started looking at John Finley, because I was only looking at the buildings. I wasn't looking at the personality behind the buildings. And that has proven to be quite beneficial to me. So I want to thank the Finley family for coming, and I'd like to uh, say how helpful you've been, and I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> now, there have been other people spurring me on since kindergarten. <laughs> it has been uh, uh, a niece of John Finley, uh, who is uh, Julie Elder, uh, in my vision of life. She's still Julie Elder. <laughs> And uh, she is here as well, and I thank you for coming, and I know that you helped your cousins and your aunt kind of make the, the trip here. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank photographers, Jan, for the work you've done in taking the pictures, my friend Don Durkee, 
we started out one day taking pictures of Finley houses and uh, that was one of the spurs to move us down the road. So both Jan and John, thank you very much. Um, now I'm living in Ottawa. Uh, I have to find a residence to live in when I come here and the hotel Roseberry has been a most convenient place. <laughs> so I'd like to thank Sharon and for cheap. And cheap. <laughs> very cheap. Very cheap. Very cheap. The is excellent. The food is excellent. The air is excellent. And I thank you. And whenever I write these matters, um, I do it with a great deal of help from my wife. And that's been true not only in doing what I do with John Finley, but everything that I've written, the speeches that I wrote that, that weren't just off the cuff, um, I, even those are sometimes critiqued afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but at, at the time I write them, and I give them to Jackie, and she reads them, and she corrects the grammar and sentence structure, and says, I don't quite understand that, which would cause me to write it again. And I couldn't do the writing that I do, and I, it's a bit, for me, it's a slow process, I'll tell you, without her help. So, my sweetie, thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me move to, to John Finley. And uh, you're here to see the works of John Finley and to appreciate his career. And, uh, and so I'll try to keep it to about 20 minutes. Um, there are, I think, five architects in Elgin that we need to do research on. Uh, two of a two and two that are somewhat of lesser importance, but also notable. Um, the five are. I'll start with uh, David Kilpatrick. David Kilpatrick, the St. Thomas architect. Um, most of his works are now gone. Uh, there is a, a, a piece of the Free Trade Building that he did. George Watson did the main building of the Free Trade Building, and uh, this David Kilpatrick. Uh, and he was practicing uh, from the mid-70s until 1882 when he went to California. Uh, second architect is Mark Buffy. And Mark Buffy was in Aylmer with a little bit of work in Dutton and West Warren. But his career was basically in Aylmer. But then, after a while, architects can't find work and they have to go somewhere else. And so he went to London. There are a very few of Mark Buffy's work still. Um, he did the McGregor Public School in particular, uh, the old McGregor Public School, the old Elmer Public School on, on John Street South. He did the high school, the Elmer High School that has been torn down, so they built a new high school. He did the Swiss Cottage, which is the little ornate building directly across the road from the high school. And he's somebody we need to do more work on. Jay-Z Long, luckily Lawrence did quite a study on Jay-Z Long that's been published and that resulted in uh, uh, that work in Balaclava being uh, declared a heritage building. And uh, Jay-Z Long was here and did a number of buildings, including the Massawood Hospital. Balaclava is major work that still exists, and I thank Lawrence for doing the work on Jay-Z Long. Uh, Neil Darrell, who is the most notable architect because he was the architect uh, during the most formative period of St. Thomas. So he did uh, the courthouse, the rebuilding of the courthouse. He didn't do the original courthouse in 1853, but when the courthouse uh, had the disastrous fire in 1898, then he did the, the courthouse, the rebuilding of the courthouse, and the courthouse that we now know. Um, he did, among other things, Washington Street Public School, and then he did Myrtle Street Public School, and as you'll learn, was a partner of uh, Finley for a short while. Uh, and then John Finley, who, I look upon as the, the maybe the most prolific. I can count in Elgin County some 359 buildings that John Finley designed. And that's the majority of the work, I'm quite sure. But there are other works throughout southwestern Ontario that I don't know about, that a future historian will find out about, and uh, that uh, will add to that list. But when I first started looking at John Finley, I've been collecting a lot of information, as Michael mentioned, over the past uh, 20 years. Uh, and then when I got on my bicycle uh, oh, in the spring a year and a half ago and started riding around town taking pictures, I was, um, I was just floored by the number. There are 100 Finleys north of Talbot Street. 
And we all know there's nothing north of Tall Street. <laughs> <laughs> but there are. There are none on Malakoff Street, I disappoint me to say. But there are a hundred Finleys north. There are Finleys on Redan Street, can you believe it? Because at that time, St. Thomas was a wealthy, fairly concentrated city, and people were building these buildings, and, and he did an amazing amount. Let me just mention two, uh, what I'll call lesser architects, but people I think that are very talented. Um, uh, Edwin, Edwin Ware did uh, the McLaughlin House at 1 Wellington, and he did the house at 5 Wellington. I don't know what else he did, but I thought he had a moment where he was produce something that's memorable in St. Thomas. Where? Okay. And the other one that I don't know much about that, that needs a look is Bud Morley. I thought that the house at 8, 8 Drake Street, the Brawley house at 8 Drake Street, was the Finley, and I thought that was going to be the jewel at the end. You know, he did this modern house. But I've understood uh, subsequently that it was Bud Morley working in Finley's office at that time that did that house and greatly upset the neighborhood, I understand, because they were so used to the conventional red brick, con conventional St. Thomas house that this was such, it was uh, so modern. He also did the first of the St. Joe's High School, a building that's been torn down and I've seen a picture of. And it was a, a very delicate piece of modern architecture. And I guess the reason I do this is because I think a lot of these buildings are worthwhile saving. I don't believe every building is worthwhile saving. I'm not of that ilk. But I believe a lot of good architecture is worthwhile saving. And I think tonight we have examples from John Finley of buildings that are certainly worthwhile architecture. Let me talk briefly about John. I was advised that a narrative that goes from the beginning to the end is somewhat boring, so I'll jump around. <laughs> I know I won't. <laughs> I'm too much of a historian. Now, uh, let me divide his life into little segments. His earliest life, he's born in uh, October 1884 um, in Inverness, Scotland. Don't know anything about him. I'll have to make a trip there to find out a little bit about it. I don't have that planned as yet, however. <laughs> but uh, uh, he um, lives, as far as I know, and is raised in Inverness because he did uh, was a member of the of the Cameron Highlanders, which was the the regiment or the battalion the regiment, I guess, of Inverness, Scotland. Um, where he was trained as an architect, I don't know. I don't know whether it was at a school or whether or not it was in an office. But he had a training as an architect that the other architects of St. Thomas, until we get to bed, but Morley, did not have. He, his architecture was that of an artist and somebody who was trained. It wasn't somebody who worked in construction, such as Jay-Z Long and Neil Darrow, and therefore, from books and experience, learned to draw buildings. He was a trained person from an architect. I can tell that by, by the way that uh, his architecture is done. Um, in, um, I think, 1907, he decided that he would leave Scotland. He came from Glasgow to Montreal. I don't know if the reason he came was uh, in part because the uh, Robert Finlay, also from Inverness, Scotland, at the time was a very prominent architect in Montreal. He did the Sun Life Building, which is the major building of Montreal of the time. And I don't know if there's a family connection between those. I think there might have been, since they were both from Inverness, it might not have been close because he did not stay there. And I don't know how he came to be with Neil Darrow. It, I have read that he was in London for a while, but he doesn't appear in the street directories of London. But in 1908, he appears in the street directory of St. Thomas. So in the, I would assume, between May of 1907 and 1908, he is in St. Thomas. He's boarding uh, uh, on Metcalf Street in a house that no longer exists on Metcalf Street. And he's working in the office of Neil Darrow as a draftsman. Um, He's there for 
only about a year to a year and a half, and again, we don't know for sure, we have to go by street directories, because he does not appear in the 1909 street directory in St. Thomas, he appears in Toronto. And he goes and he works for a large firm called Ellis and Connor. They looked up the houses and the buildings that they built at that time, and there is some connection between what John built subsequently and what I see in a church on St. Clair Avenue West and a house that I see on Annette Street in Toronto. And so from someone else, he picks up some ideas of architecture, and that becomes John Finley, the architect, and he brings that back to St. Thomas. In 1911, Neil Darrow, because there was a shortage of business, and because he had a former student who had a practice in Regina, left St. Thomas and went to Regina. St. Thomas needed an architect and must have been impressed with Finley as an architect because somebody made a connection with him and he returned to St. Thomas and took over Neil Darrow's office. And almost immediately he had work. It may be that there was a slight recession here and that was why there was a decline. It may be that people became a little bit uh, disenchanted with Neil's style because there was a repetition to Neil's style that perhaps people decided that they would wait. But he almost immediately had work and he had an abundance of work. And he worked singly, Neil being in Regina, by himself in an office. I don't know if he had a draftsman as a helper, but he was the only architect in St. Thomas. And he worked from 1911 through the war up until 1918. He had bought a house at 15 Margaret. Not 15 Margaret today, but 17 Margaret today, at the Adam Piotrowski house. And uh, uh, he lived, he and his wife lived in that house at 17 or 15 Margaret, and that's where Donald was born, it was in that particular house. Uh, but they sold that house, and I've got that from Land Records, and they went to Toronto in 19, um, in 19, what did I say, 18. Um, he went to Toronto and got a job working for the Grand Trunk Railroad in the Building and Bridges Division, and he lived there for two years. He, and was it Anne or Annie? And he, Anne, and Donald in Toronto on Vermont Avenue, which I've been able to trace down. And interestingly, Vermont Avenue is very close to the Witchwood development. I don't know if you know that, that's that beautiful arts and crafts development just downtown a bit to the north in Toronto. I'm not sure what influences him or not. Uh, I'm sure that he would not be in that area of Toronto without knowing about that arts and crafts development, and he would pay attention to that, I'm quite sure. Um, at any rate, as he goes to Toronto, for different reasons, Neil Darrow comes back, lives in St. Thomas for two or three years, works alone. Finley then returns to St. Thomas in about 1921. They form a partnership, and for the next four to five years, they are partners as Darrow and Finley. And as Darrow and Finley, they did Elm Street, Elmdale, no, Elm, Elmdale Street Public School, okay? They did the Dutton Town Hall. They did, Don tells me, the, the, the Western Dairy, uh, which is down the Western Dairy, across from the City Dairy, uh, where Mr. Bristol used to be in charge, I think, at that time, had previously been down where the, the uh, Labor Temple was back in that area, but they had a new building built, and so they were there. Uh, and so he and, he and Daryl practiced together for that period of time. It was in that period of time that he built his own house out in Lyndhurst. Lyndhurst at that time was basically agricultural land. There were a few houses just as you come around and come up the hill on the Crescent Ave, uh, but almost nothing in the picture. I think, I haven't looked at the display that carefully, but there's a picture of, of John's house there, I think, and it must have been taken after Mac's house was built in the 30s because both Mac and John's house is together, and, and it's basically fields. And uh, John um, and Anne and Donald lived in that new house. They had a car, and so uh, they were in that house. Right? And, and, and I should have mentioned, I'm, I'm so excuse me, that the other building that Darrow and Finley built was the Memorial Hospital. And I think we have pictures of the Memorial Hospital as well. Uh, Neil Darrow died in 1926, and uh, John Finley continued on. Um, 
He continued on until 1947. He was in St. Thomas all, all that time with the exception of a short period during the Second World War when he was in Ottawa working. I'm not sure whether or not he was in Ottawa because, the, not, I'm sure because of the demand for an architect during the war to build facilities, also because business might have been a bit shallow here. Architect, being an architect is, is a, it's a love, I'm quite sure, and it's demanding. You can imagine, it's not like painting. It's not like you're sitting in a room and you're painting, and if it doesn't work out quite right, you've got a canvas there, and that's it, and a small investment. You've got an investment for somebody that's the major investment of perhaps their lifetime, and you're designing and guaranteeing them that this house is going to have just the exact roof that you need and the windows, and it's going to be well built, and it's going to be stylish, etc. And uh, so it's a real challenge to be an architect. And um, it's also uh, things that depend on clients hiring you to do. And when economic conditions are not prime, then as an architect, things are, are, are a bit short. And I, I don't say this in my article, but I, as I didn't want to mention Don's name in the article, but Don Anderson told me that when he asked uh, John Finney to design the house at, uh, at 16, uh, Roseberry, um, that John had not had a commission for some time and needed the work desperately. And so um, that's what, what an architect needs. They need commissions to do the work, to make a living to live. So, um, so that was John, and then, and, and then he, uh, then he uh, had his last commissions um, the, the two significant last commissions that he had were at, well, thank you. Uh, were at Elma College. And uh, uh, he did an addition at Elma College, and he also did the Ella, Bowes, Ella D. Bose Memorial Chapel. Now, Ella Bose was still alive when it was done. It's like the George Thorman Memorial Library. Do you remember that? Don? <laughs> <laughs> Forget who announced it. When George was still alive, they opened the library at Parkside. They announced that it was the George Thorman Memorial Library at Parkside. George was there. George said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, this was the Ella Bowes Chapel at the time, subsequently known as the Ella Bowes, and she had been a principal of significance at Elma, and he did that little chapel. It's such a delicate and beautiful little work, and yet you see it now because somebody hasn't looked after it and because they haven't cared, it's now in ruins. I mean, the brick from that church came from a, a, a church or a building that was torn down in Nilestown. So it was bricked with that brick so that it had a look of, of kind of historic quality, even though it was a new building. Anyways, he did those two. Uh, he, I want to talk about his styles. I'll go back to that. But let me just finish the narrative. Uh, he died in December of 1947, suddenly, um, uh, unexpected, um, and um, it was so well thought of that um, the workmen at his project at Elma College all laid down their tools that day and went to his funeral. Um, there were two write-ups that I want to mention uh, in the uh, Times Journal about him. One was the editorial that praised him, said that he was not only an architect of artistic talent, but that also he was an architect who brought his projects in on um, price, which is always important. Um, and that he would be sorely missed not only in St. Thomas but Western Ontario, which leads me to believe there are other buildings that I don't know about in Western Ontario. Um, the other was a little column, a very short little brief note, and this I got from, from Terry in a family collection, and it was by Pete Birdsell in Hank's Corner. Hank's Corner was a regular column in the Times Journal, and Pete Birdsell said something that just touches me which is that St. Thomas never, ne or that Scotland never sent a finer son to Canada than John Finley. And I thought, wow, what a touching thing to say about somebody. So that's the life he lived. Let me talk briefly about John as an artist and uh, the styles that he, he, he designed in. Um, not all architects are artists. Neil Darrow was not an artist. 
Neil Darrow was a solid builder. He had a sense of design, but he was somebody who was he designed by geometric pattern and without flair. His buildings are solid buildings. They're good looking buildings. They follow the rules, but they don't have the flair that Finley had. I learned he was an artist by being at, uh, at Eileen's uh, when the, the day that she brought out, uh, or uh, the cartoons for one thing, but the second, uh, a little doodle that he did as he sat and sketched. And I learned that he did that continuously. And I also know that to be an architect of note, that you have to combine both the sense of tradition of what architecture is with your own drawing skill, which comes out of your hand, your mind, and your heart. And I think John truly had that. And that's why we see these exceptional buildings. He was also a trained supervisor, and so his buildings were very well built with the best of materials, which were available at that time at a reasonable price. And Jim Sanders has praised the, the, his house and the woods that, that, uh, that John used in those houses. Um, he, he used, let me talk briefly about four styles, as you'll see this in the write-up. Uh, when John came to Canada, uh, a prominent style in the country was Edwardian classicism. And the public library of St. Thomas, the old public library of St. Thomas, would be in that style. That's by Darrow. Okay, as with most of the red bricks we see around that we associate with St. Thomas houses. That was what John designed some of his early buildings in, such as 7 Drake or 79 uh, Metcalf Street. Um, and uh, so many of the houses on Myrtle Street and on Forest Ave are of that same design. For some reason, he developed, perhaps because of client request or his own, I think his Scottish nature and the fact that he was raised in Inverness, where things were simpler, where houses were smaller, and therefore he developed that Edward classicism into something that was, as Mike pointed out, and I want to mention this at the end, I'll come back to that, that, that was something not international, which I said in the one article that, that Deb published, and I thank Deb for doing that. Um, I think a better term is the kind of a simpler Edwardian classicism. And that would be uh, Centennial School, Locke School, the Fingal Public School, the Sparta Public School. They're still in, in they use some classical features to them. They're basically geometric, but they're quite simple buildings. And I think that term, kind of a simplified Edwardian classicism, fits well with that. Uh, second thing I want to mention is he must have been influenced by, a little bit by Frank Lloyd Wright, who was the architect of note of the day. Frank, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright out of Chicago, but also Buffalo. And of course, with the New York Central, people in St. Thomas, and John in particular will be familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright. Because I see in the, in the Pinkham houses, out in Lyndhurst, 40 and 44 Lyndhurst. And also, and maybe in particular, in the 58 Queen Street, the house that Bruce Benning used to live in, that the Valentine, Phil Valentine lives in. It, I thought it was a renovation, but actually understand that he built that new in 20 or 21. And it's got the features of, of Frank Lloyd Wright. I mean, not full-blown Frank Lloyd Wright. We're not talking about the Guggenheim Museum or something like that. We're talking about Frank Lloyd Wright and the prairie style with the way that he did the roof lines with the overhang with an entrance that goes from the, from the side instead of up to the front. Um, just, I understand from the inside of the Valentine House, which I haven't seen and hope to do, um, is um, mission furniture and mission detail in the woodworking and stained glass windows. So there's a little bit of Frank Lloyd Wright in John as well. Um, the most important aspect of John in style though is the arts and crafts movement. There was a movement that started in, in England as a reaction to the industrial production of everything 
and they wanted individual craftsmen to still be appreciated and so this arts and crafts movement starts. And I think John most likely picked that up in training that he had in Scotland and he brought it here. At the same time it's happening in the United States and particularly from California back through the United States in a magazine called the Craftsman Magazine. So you see the arts and crafts. Um, he did almost every house on Farley Place. And if you look down Farley Place, only two houses that he didn't do. Um, he did that Uri house right on the corner at two. Okay, and then he did the Sanders, what became the Sanders house next to that. He did all those houses down and they're all in arts and crafts. And that's American arts and crafts in those particular cases. You will see the same houses spotted down Forest Ave and down Myrtle Street. You see them on Sunset Drive, a couple in Port Stanley around. I did a lot of those. And then he also developed his own house is in a British arts and crafts. And his own house is a really an interesting place where it's simple, it's small inside. It's not a big house. It was a small kitchen. You come in the front door and you go up a staircase, it's a narrow staircase, um, to a top where then it turns so that you can't see the upstairs. Like you're not, you're not um, or you're privy to the private areas of the house, okay? So you can't see up that stair, but there's a simple staircase that goes up. There are three bedrooms, I think, three bedrooms up there. Um, not big bedrooms, relatively small bedrooms. Um, but more done, I, I might just use the term, and do we know for sure that it was called the Croft? That's in the letter from, I, I, I always said it's one of those. Was the Croft. <clears throat> and, and, and so that, that Crofters, that Croft, that Scottish, and he used the same style uh, in particular to do the one uh, uh, that he did for St. Thomas Smith at 97 Stanley Street. Uh, let me not forget that he also used some American in the Don Anderson's house at 16 Roseberry is in an American colonial revival style, uh, as is 115 Stanley Street, as are two little gems, one at 49 Alexander, which is as close as we get to Malcrop Street. <laughs> <laughs> That's the North Gardner house. Um, well, he just did so many. I can't talk about them all, and they're there for you to see. Let me last. Uh, let me end on two points. I think we should uh, be aware of John Finney, which most people in St. Thomas were not. Uh, we do have a listing. I think Mike received my listing of 359 houses, and I hope that that will be publicized so that the people that that own those houses will take that into consideration not only in their care but in their price because they should demand a premium price they're beautiful in some cases small houses uh, so i'm hoping that we can publicize john finley and what he's done people become more aware of his houses become more aware of him as an artist because what he's creating is public art i mean that i'm sure my sense of what architecture is starts with neil darrell and with John Finley. And I think he was a, had a fabulous career. Now before I leave all that, let me once but mention one more thing. My 20 minutes must be closed up, right? <laughs> <laughs> the kids would be closing their books now. There's no book. There's, we're done. We're waiting for that bell, let me tell you. Three or four of them have to have a smoke so bad. <laughs> like Vicki Sanders here, she's oh, just yeah. dying. <laughs> At any rate. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> um, what, I, what, I, what I'm posting with people's help and the essay that I've written and the essay that, was, uh, that has already been published in Rally Sheldon is not a definitive work. This is not something that, this is an ongoing project. And so I'm hoping that if we put out a booklet, we say to people that if you have any evidence that your house is a John Finley, and should be added to the list, please let us know. Or if you find that it's a knockoff, I thought one in Elmer, on Water Street in Elmer, there's a beautiful little Finley. Well, what happened was, <coughs> the woman who had the house built came to St. Thomas, looked on Sunset Drive, said, that's the house I want, and her builder built the house. And John didn't get paid a commission for it. But it's, you know, it's so it's a knockoff, it doesn't really count, but, uh, 
that it, it's a continuing process and that's what I hope that people will treat this as I may have made some errors in my judgment in, in what I'm saying and it, lots of it I don't have proof because there are no building permits that I can find. If the city has building permits, they have them buried in a, over in London in a, in a warehouse where they have some documents, and I didn't have access to those, and I don't know that they have them. Uh, but I can tell going down the street now, I've looked at so many, I can tell that that's a Finley. You know, even if it's just a renovation, on, on Roseberry Place, right at the corner of Elgin and Roseberry, there are two little porches that I wrote about in those articles that Mike had. And they were, the, the, uh, the home was owned by a Mr. Utter, and he had these two porches in. They're by Finley. They're so delicately beautiful that no one else in St. Thomas had the talent to do that when they were done. Coming down the street is where Bob Lemon, you know Bob Lemon the architect? Where Robert Lemon used to live, if, if you look uh, from the hotel, straight across the front lawn, uh, across from 18 to 16 uh, Roseberry, you look at the side, you'll see a dormer there that's got to be a Finley. When you look at Marlon Paul's, the Paul Jeffrey house, uh, it'll always be the Paul Jeffrey house, by the way. <laughs> uh, but when you look at that house, they, you can see the porch on the side. That's a Finley porch. And the little room at the front of George Thorman's, a Finley edition. They're just, they're all over. And they're so delicately done that the guy really was a genius. Let me end by saying it is a work in progress. When I was writing this, I had used the term international style. Mike, who's knowledgeable in architecture as well, said to me, you know, that's not the best style because really international style means that it's a means van der Rohe's and it's the late 20s and early 30s and you're talking about just you know after the war a better term would be uh, Edwardian classicism modified simplified etc and so I changed that when this essay was written and that's the way that history happens history happens that somebody gets an idea they do the research and then somebody finds out something that's right or wrong or needs to be modified and they modify it and then you get a little closer to the truth. And so I hope in that spirit that we've done a good job. I want to thank Mike not only for his interaction with me on the history thing, but for a beautiful display that he has set up here. And Jan's going to take some more pictures of the schools, I assume. Oh, they're so, ready. It just oh, they, they won't be here till tomorrow. The next okay, day. so we're going to have more schools. So, and I hope that we're going to have a booklet. We that's the essay from the booklet, and there'll be a list of all the properties in St. Thomas and Elgin that at this point I think are family prop, and I hope people become kind of house proud of the fact that they own a, a house that was designed by a phenomenal architect, local, not big time, but really an asset to this community, John Finley. Thanks very much. Crescent Ave. So it's as you go up, there are two houses side by side. John built the first one, I think they're about 1923, and I think he built the second one a little bit later because I did find back in May, and May was uh, Anne and May were sisters. They were Leith's from Jackson Street, and Mac, her husband. And so I did find that they live, I forget the street now, Erie Street or somewhere uh, uh, in the in the 20s at any rate. <coughs> so I don't think they were built at the same time. I think one was built a little bit later. And uh, I should mention too, and I'm trying to put all this together. John was uh, very interested in, in horticulture, particularly wildflowers. And Mac and May had beautiful gardens, and John's had, and, and Ann had gardens. Their gardens were basically down the hill. Uh, behind and he had beautiful and Josie's trying to do some work I think on the gardens down Josie Cousins owns that house now Grant owns and uh, I don't know who owns the, the Mac and May house uh, anyway for that.
anybody has any questions, please ask later. And thank you very much for coming.